All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And we are back. This is our fourth speaker for the day. Uh, this is Dr. Daniel Hummel. Dr. Hummel is coming to us from the University of Louisiana Monroe, where he is an assistant professor of political science and public administration. And I'll have you know that he uh, has taught with us in the MPA program uh, and is very well liked uh, among his students uh, and specializes uh, in methods, which we, we really appreciate. Uh, but uh, Dr. Hummel, uh, again, is an assistant professor of political science at uh, Louisiana Monroe. He teaches budgeting and finance, state and local government, uh, American urban politics, intergovernmental relations, and probably uh, a little bit of other things, too. Uh, he's published in Local Economy, Public Policy and Administration, Review of Religious Research, uh, Journal of Public Budgeting, Accounting and Financial Management, and several other publications as well. Uh, his most recent publication is a book with Roman and Littlefield on the policy, uh, policy diffusion of anti-Sharia laws in the United States. Uh, he regularly presents at the Western Social Science Association and at Midwest, and he is actively involved with the interfaith community and regularly serves on panels and initiatives that strive for peace, tolerance, and understanding and respect between communities. So uh, his talk today is going to be about religiosity emphasizing public service. And with that, Daniel Hummel, I will give you the floor. Yeah, thank you. It sounded so much better when you said it than when I wrote it. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that was pretty good. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Atkins. And I, I really appreciate being invited to do this. And I'm actually going to share my screen, if that's okay. Uh, and I'm going to just share my PowerPoint that I have produced here. So uh, I think everyone can see that, right? Uh, Great, excellent. And I'm coming in loud and clear. I'm using a new microphone here. So uh, it's a professional thing that I, I purchased uh, when I thought that we were never gonna come back in person, that we were gonna be online for forever and, and you know just kind of stay in our, our houses. But it's so nice for actually, I've been teaching classes back in person. Uh, and it's, I have to admit that I was, it was a little, I was a little sh socially awkward at first. <laughs> I was like, I'm in a classroom of other human beings. Uh, I feel weird. Uh, people are looking at me. Normally, I'm just looking at the Zoom stream with all the all the cameras turned off, right? Uh, and so uh, it's it's been such a pleasure. And actually, when I was teaching uh, qualitative methods uh, at uh, uh, Lincoln Memorial, I I really uh, enjoyed the students, even though it was online. Uh, we actually had synchronous meetings where we would meet weekly and, and go over many of the methodologies that we were exploring and that they were applying to their projects and just a, a great group of students and I look forward to doing it again uh, Dr. Atkins uh, working with the students uh, over the summer a new group of students of course so anyways uh, this is related to a project that I've been working on for a few years. Uh, originally, it was a project focused on the effects of kind of religion, religion, religiosity, and a religious ideology on um, state budgeting, local budgeting. And what I found really quickly uh, when I was attempting to, to publish some of this research was that people in governmental budgeting and finance, they, they want to hear none of that, of course, because for them, religion uh, is not applicable anymore in, in public service and in public management and government. But the, here's the deal, uh, government, and we're not just talking about the politicians, we're talking about the administrators are made up of people. And, and people uh, are, are quite religious. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to take a general survey of the population, but uh, I mean, I live in Louisiana now. Um, the, the, the best time to go to supermarkets uh, is Sunday morning because everybody, everybody is at church, right? So, uh, you know, what you might have a different experience with if you're in Europe, for instance. Uh, so, you know, when Europeans come here, uh, they, they don't understand just uh, why or how it's uh, so religious here. I need to turn off my email here. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and get this uh, PowerPoint going. And you've already had my background, so I really don't have to go into that. The only thing I can add is I love hiking and biking. And, you know, maybe one day when the MPA program expands uh, and you can hire in more faculty members, right? Just, uh, Dr. Atkins, you can bring me in to, 
Lincoln Memorial and we could do some hiking and biking together in Harrogate and other places in Eastern Tennessee. And uh, those types of areas there are just wonderful uh, uh, places to go and visit. And I do that on a regular basis as much as I can. Um, and so, yeah, I do. I do research in a lot of areas. Um, this particular research is on public policy and issues of public values and norms. And, um, and so that's really what was the center of this book chapter that I worked on when I was invited by um, Dr. Breyer, who's at um, University of Central Florida, to, to write this chapter. Uh, I had written some things in, um, uh, in some online periodicals on just how religion affects how people govern, right? how they, I'm not just talking about politicians, and politicians use religion, right? And actually, one of the things I forgot to do when I shared my screen was I forgot to share my audio because I have audio to the screen. So let me let me stop sharing for just a minute and I'll share again. And this time I will make sure I share sound. Okay, there we go. There we go. So uh, since I mentioned that, I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot to share my sound. Um, and so um, he had seen this, these, these writings, these periodicals that I uh, had been contributing to and realized that it was kind of an important area in public administration to cover, but it's not an area that people like to cover. Uh, as I was mentioning, with like trying to publish his papers in public budget and finance journals, like they just don't want to hear it. Like they, you know, in academia, uh, in public administration, it's really difficult to even talk about religion because uh, it's always, we, we always have this like idea that it, it doesn't apply. Like when people leave their religion at the door when they come to work. Well, is that really true? <laughs> you know, I mean, we all notice intuitively that, that that's not true, right? People are very religious uh, and that, has, that plays out in different ways. And I'm gonna get into that into, in a slideshow. Um, it can play out in good ways. It can play out in very positive ways when we talk about the zeal for public service, serving other people, helping other people. I mean, if you look at our nonprofits, you look at our, uh, you know, our governing institutions, I mean, and there's research to back me up on this, they're, they're, they're quite religious uh, and they look at their job from a very uh, faith-based perspective, like they're serving other people. Um, and uh, and I, one of the things I, I kind of mentioned in, the, in my book chapter here is, well, certainly it's not the prestige and certainly not the wealth of uh, financial resources that draw people to, to, to public service positions, right? Because we know that, you know, like a city manager doing that job, if he was a manager of a company, he'd be making millions of dollars, but as a city manager for a city, he's making hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a good job good pay, but he'd be making 10 times that amount if he was in a private sector. So why choose a public sector, right? So there has to be something intrinsic there, right? So um, so I was invited and I said, okay, yeah, I'll write this. Uh, I'll, I'll contribute to this. So I, I figured, okay, let's, let's get into this. So uh, I had this discussion with my students the other day. Religion doesn't necessarily have to be religion based on like say, uh, a holy text, okay? So religion has different manifestations. Uh, there is religion, like, in the sense of, like, institutions uh, and how we, we have such a, we, we, we apply sacredness to our institutions. Like, for instance, the burning of the flag, you can see in that picture. So we had a very, very interesting discussion in one of my classes uh, recently where um, I, I asked the students, so, okay, so we have a free speech circle on campus, right? Where I can go to the free speech circle on campus and I can say anything I want, right? I mean, within limits, of course, I can't call for the death of people and, and I certainly um, you know, can't do anything. You know, there, there's limited free speech and I'll leave it up to Dr. Adkins you know, to get into the legalities of that, right? But, um, but I can burn a flag, you know? I mean, that's part of free speech. Free speech is I can, I can go to the free speech circle and I can burn the American flag. Um, there's a lot of court cases on that, it goes all the way back. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of court cases that have verified that, yeah, it's part of, of, of free expression. Um, but is it, would, what would, I asked the students, what would happen to me, <laughs> you know, on campus, if I was strolling the campus with a flag burning, would I, would I, would somebody attack me? Would somebody, you know, would I be attacked by somebody? And they said, almost all of them said 100 percent yes, there, there would be it would not be a good thing, right? And, and the thing that I, I raised the question about why, what's so important, you know, what, what is so, so sanctified about this 
this item, right? Or, or not standing for the national anthem. Well, this is because our secular institutions have been imbued with kind of sacredness and this sacredness actually is part of what keeps society cohesive. And in, in what Haidt calls, so Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist, uh, argued that all civilizations are based on some mortal foundations. And in particular, what, what I'm talking about here is the, the psychology of sacredness, things that are, are sacred to us. They don't have to be necessarily religion or religious, right? But certainly that gets wrapped up with a lot of religion or religious institutions. But, and I'll, you'll see in the next slide here that it, it could be, you know, such as a declaration of independence, like those we would consider to be very holy documents for us, right, as Americans. The constitution clearly uh, is a holy document. It's something that uh, we all revere, you know, we, 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 we revere the constitution. It would be hard to have a, a cohesive society that didn't respect and love the institutions of the country that, that didn't have some sort of uh, pride and, and, and consider with some level of sacredness to those institutions. Uh, because in the absence of that, society tends to break apart. Uh, so there's a really interesting book that Haidt published a few years ago called The Righteous Mind, Why People, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. It is an excellent read, by the way. Um, probably, and it's, he's a social psychologist, so he's going to approach it from that perspective. But if you're a political science student or public administration student, uh, you're really going to appreciate the politics aspect and how you know, religion is, it continues to be uh, to, to move society. It's, it's, you know, if you look at like the late, the discourse in the late 20th century, everyone was like, religion's dead, right? So that was the thing, religion's dead. No one's gonna, no one, you know, churches are gonna empty out. It's not gonna be a single person going to church. We can now repurpose those buildings. Uh, you know, we can make them the community centers, right? Or different things. Uh, what is interesting though, in the 2000s is that the exact opposite happened, right? Now, of course, there was a lot of turmoil at that time, which tends to lead people to want to be more religious. But, uh, you know, the generally religiosity has remained pretty constant, although with the younger generations, it always is lower than with the older generations, right? Which we know that, you know, we just kind of know that implicitly. Um, but yeah, so sacredness is part of what creates a love for the nation, right? I mean, I asked the students this question in my class. I said, how many of you stand when the national anthem is playing, right? So um, it's not compulsory. No one's gonna come and hit you over top of the head, right? You're not gonna be arrested if you don't stand for the national anthem. Uh, but why, so why is I feel such a, a, a compulsion to stand? And why is it when someone chooses not to stand that it creates such uh, anger? I mean, we're talking several years ago with Colin Kaepernick and, and it, it, you know, it, it hurt his career. It, you can't you can't say oh he's a bad player hey, you know any worse than anyone else in that position it hurt his career to do that right uh, and so uh, because of that sacredness that people apply to the national anthem you take off your hat I see people mouthing the words of the anthem uh, sometimes people are crying sometimes you know people are just into it right and 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 not every country does that but um, we certainly do and it becomes part of the the uh, uh, the sacredness of the, of the nation, right? Good or bad, and I'm gonna get into that. So don't think I'm making like a appeal like this. It's a good saying, right? I'm just saying let's let's we have to understand it before we can get into it. Um, okay, so what's a civil religion? Was well, exactly what I've been kind of getting into. And Dr. Atkins, I don't know if you want me to like stop at any time to like take questions, or I'm just gonna keep on rolling. We'll have a time for questions and answers at the end. Okay, perfect. So I, I, I have this situation where I start getting into my class and I'm like, oh yeah, wait a minute. I need to stop and see what's going on here. Does everyone understand? <laughs> Am I going too fast? So uh, civil religion is basically what I've been talking about is the replacement of actual religion with the religion of the state, right? And and so uh, I know that that's kind of that's got, that's, that term has gotten loaded like a state state based religion like we don't call it a religion right we just we don't call it anything we call it patriotism I don't know and so but the I the understanding is it of it is that because religion left the public space especially in Europe 
after the Renaissance, there was a gap. And that gap had to be, had to be filled by something else to create cohesion in society. And it's really, this idea of cohesion is really important. And, and I'll, I'm gonna talk about Rousseau here in the next slide, what, 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 what John Jacques Rousseau said about cohesion and why cohesion in society cannot be based on law alone, and it cannot be based on the threat of force alone, because that only goes so far. And so it has to be based on something that we can agree on. It's, it's sacred and valuable. That's why when I was talking about the dogma here and at the very bottom of the slide, the dogma of Americanness, right? Uh, the sacred text, like you might not even heard that term being used before when talking about the Constitution, the Declaration of the Indian. Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights, but yeah, the sacred texts, we, we have made them sacred, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that we made them sacred to the point they can't be changed, especially when we talk about the Constitution, certainly it has changed. Uh, but it in itself cannot be abolished, right? It is the Constitution of the United States. It is what makes the United States the United States. It's what our judges are always referencing back to in, in addition to case law, but it's all based on some sort of constitutional uh, you know, aspect of the constitution. It's something that is built into the very fabric of the nation and without it, I don't know what would, what would bind us, right? Without those documents, what would bind the American people more than the Declaration of Independence, the constitution, the Bill of Rights? What would bind us? I mean, I mean, if you had a chance to travel across the country to go from Tennessee to Louisiana and, and beyond, you're gonna you're gonna notice that we're a very diverse country with different ideas and different things. And and but you talk to people from California to Idaho to Tennessee, and at the very core is okay, the Constitution. That is that is what makes America America. We at the very we can disagree on a lot of things, but the Constitution is valuable to all of us, right? So that was part of an effort that started in Europe before there was even the United States to secularize the sacredness that binds society. Um, religious language, as it says here, was used and is still used to this day to promote moral imperatives of the state. And that's the reason why we have many of our politicians, many times who are not particularly religious themselves, will find that they are compelled uh, to reference religion many times when they're talking about uh, some new law or some new program or some new initiative, right? Um, and you'll, I have some examples. That's why I wanted to share my audio of politicians using religious language. And we don't even like bat an eye at it, right? We, we, we become so accustomed to, to this an intrusion of religion into our public life that it is something that uh, we don't, we just kind of accept it. And some of us who are even applaud it and feel that if there's an absence of that religiousness in our public life, that it, uh, something's being taken away from it, right? Okay, so uh, this is John Jacques Rousseau. And I give you a little background about why I like to reference Rousseau is that, so logo thinking, mytho thinking, Logo is thinking kind of legal based thinking, right? Everything is legal, everything is law. And certainly the United States can be easily termed a logocracy, right? A system completely uh, based and founded and carried out on the basis of law, right? It is an, an important uh, part of, of governing in this country. And, it would be hard to even imagine uh, our, our system functioning without the courts. <laughs> uh, and, and so it's, uh, it's, it is, it, it, I mean, some, some of my uh, friends who come from other countries will come to the United States and realize that our legal system is quite robust. Uh, there is a law for literally everything, <laughs> literally everything. Uh, and, um, and that can be a little bit bewildering, uh, especially if you don't study law or understand law like me. I'm just like, ah, what is going on? <laughs> uh, but it is, it's true. But here's the thing that Rousseau really emphasized is that you cannot, and I, I mentioned this before, you cannot govern through force or even reason because people are mythos thinkers. People are not, um, pure rational animals. They are emotional. 
and they, they need emotional connections. And emotional connections does not come through logo thinking at all. It doesn't come through that at all. It comes through uh, the connections I have with other people, with shared values and shared interests. You know, I mean, I remember, uh, I don't know if I could share this, Dr. Adkins, but I, I, maybe people know you very well. I don't know if they know you very well, but so I wanna, we, we met uh, at a cafe in Knoxville. And I didn't know Dr. Adkins besides just interviewing for the adjunct position for the summer. And, and, and uh, but I wanted to know him personally. I wanna know him. And uh, I mentioned to him when we were sitting in the uh, cafe that I knew that there was an ex, pro wrestler, uh, who is the mayor of, of Knoxville County, right? It's called Knoxville also, Knoxville County. And, uh, and that I am a fan. And it turns out that, do you mind if I share this, Dr. Adkins, that you also are a fan of professional wrestling. I love professional wrestling. I think it's fun. Dr. Adkins is a fan. And as soon as Dr. Adkins said that to me, uh, I felt more connected to Dr. Atkins, because there was something that we had in common that I may run into Dr. Atkins at a pro wrestling event, right? And, and I really, and it, it's a type of person that likes that, right? It's, you know, all of my friends who like it, they're just, they're just really animated people. They're just really, they're people that really love the, the stage and they love other people. And, they, and that they feed off of other people because they feel that there is emotional connections there. And you feel emotional connections with those people. That is true. That is really true. It, it, is, um, it is more important for people to build those bonds, emotional bonds with people than just based off of the rule of law, right? I mean, we were glad that the rule of law exists. We're glad that the law exists in case there's breakdowns in those bonds, in those relationships. But, but it's not a substitu substitution for those relationships. It's not a substitution for those bonds that naturally occur between two very emotional people, right? And, and people will say, I'm not an emotional person. Believe me, it is built into our very psyche to be connected with other people. Uh, no matter how stoic you are, right? You're going, you're, you are emotionally connected with others. And, and, and in that is values and norms and ethics, and morals and what we think is good and what we think is bad. And, and, and religion is a big part of that pie. Um, not everybody is religious, but there are certain things that we're like, ooh, that's not good. And there's certain things that we're like, oh, that's wonderful that we all kind of share and say, yeah, that's right. I, I agree with that. That's, that's also within my value matrix as well. And so there was a couple of theorists on this in public administration. I mean, we got Dwight Waldo, of course, which is most famous about this because in the early 20th century, they were basically trying to argue in public administration, it was just kind of developing field in the United States at the time, that we could be a completely scientific nation where we would be, our administration would be a scientific administration and everything would be run scientifically uh, you know, and in, in, in what we found after, and it didn't last very long, what we found is that when dealing with people, uh, yes, it's good that we have a scientific approach to most of our program implementation, but when dealing with people, uh, science is just not going to make it, right? It's, it's just not that you're dealing with human beings who have emotional uh, connections with others in that it's, it, it's not something that can be summarized into a scientific equation. Right. Uh, and so Dwight Waldo was kind of pushing back on kind of the, the idea that everything could be rationalized in terms of science and David Hume as well. Right. These 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 are are kind of foundational theories that have given us a way to to incorporate in how we think administratively, politically, uh, people's uh, emotions and feelings, uh, which um, we know intuitively, but because We've been trying to force this issue of everything has to be scientific, uh, that we've lost that ability to understand that we're still dealing with human beings um, and they're not robots. So, but here's the issue, right? Where we have a, a morally heterogeneous nation and it's increasingly diverse. So our, our country, you know, 
unless you come from a very isolated small town in the middle of Tennessee uh, or West Virginia or central Pennsylvania, uh, where I grew up not far from there in Western central, Pen uh, central Pennsylvania, um, where everybody was the same, right? It was homogenous. It was German, Irish, Catholic, and some Protestants, but a lot of Catholics up there. And, um, and, and that was it. Everybody, you know, either went to this one church or the other, what was the difference between the two? And everybody looked pretty much the same racially, ethnically, religiously. It was pretty homogenous. This is not the case in most places in the United States today. Uh, in the United States today, uh, not only are we racially diverse, ethnically diverse, religiously diverse, it's just a, a greater level of variety in the United States than there has ever been in the United States and it increasingly gets more diverse, right? So there, there are a plurality of values and norms in the United States. And so this makes it, and makes it challenging uh, when you have this level of diversity and increasingly level, increasing levels of diversity. And, and again, talking about those shared values, those shared norms, those shared morals, those shared ethics. And, and, and many times there is a lot of overlap, but there's a lot of disconnect too. And you can see in many of our very diverse communities, uh, increasing levels of conflict um, between different communities in, in, in those places. And, and some of it may be for different reasons. I mean, I certainly know that prejudice is just a symptom of a larger problem uh, underlying kind of this disconnection in the community between people of different groups. And so one of the things I've done research on uh, in the past is like social identity, social dominance, uh, is a like community increasingly gets more diverse. There's kind of group consciousness and group conflict. And, and we see that happening in the United States today, right? So in a morally heterogeneous nation like the United States, many times people would approach it from a utilitarian approach, like John Rawls would, would uh, be kind of the person I think about when I think about utilitarian approach. Uh, John Rawls, uh, argued that, well, in a very diverse nation like the United States, where uh, it's impossible to have common values, common norms, uh, we can only agree on one or two things, right? Uh, and, and maybe we can only agree on the issue of fairness and ethics. And that, and that we really can't agree on the psychology of sacredness. We can't really agree on what's sacred, what's valuable, what's, what is, you know, those things I talked about before, like that's the reason why maybe there's such a disconnect in our society right now and why there is so much conflict in our society right now because we, we're not deeming sacred, everyone's not deeming sacred what everyone else is deeming sacred, right? So this is sacred to me, but not this, right? But this is sacred to me, but not this. And, and so when one person offends that, then it causes a problem in that one community. So I was thinking about uh, an event that happened at my university when I was still a student. Um, there was a professor there at Florida Atlantic University who decided to have an exercise with a sociology class on sacredness. And, and he said, all right, I want you to write something on a piece of paper that's really sacred to you. And I want you to put it on the ground and I want you to step on it. And that was the exercise, right? The, like the, the exercise was to, was to test your feelings about sacredness, what is sacred to you. So he didn't tell you what he was gonna do. He just said, write on a piece of paper, what is sacred to you, put it on the ground and step on it. Now, somebody in the class, of course, wrote the name of Jesus, right? And then they had this interesting situation where then they had to put the name of Jesus on the floor and step on it. Now, uh, of course, the student was offended by this. The professor continued to, pushed the, the, the activity and the student got really upset. It caused a big storm on our campus. Uh, I, I don't know if the professor was fired, but I do know that um, he was put on leave for a while. I don't know if he was eventually fired. See what I'm saying? Um, over a class activity, it had nothing really to do with religion, just had to do with sacredness. What was sacred to you? And of course, somebody put something down that was religious. So uh, that is that exercise to me kind of caught, like I said, okay, Maybe, the, maybe Jesus 
is not necessarily sacred to me because I'm not a Christian. Okay. So, but I have to understand that it's sacred for other people. And therefore, I care about you as a person. Therefore, I don't want to do anything that offends you as a Christian by, by taking something that's sacred to you and, and destroying it, right? But that street goes two ways. And this is where the complication gets into because we have the majority group, predominantly white, Christian, uh, Protestant, um, that is very sensitive about things that happen that offends their sensitivities to their sacredness. But then you have religious minorities and others who uh, many times are not given the same level of consideration. And that what's considered sacred for them is not given uh, that same credence, right? And many times is mocked. And many times what's sacred to them is often trashed, right? So that is, that is uh, where society, the fissures in society tend to start to build. And so John Rawls will say, well, in that type of situation, the only thing we can rely on is procedural values of fairness, but it doesn't satisfy, again, those emotional connection issues that we have to have with other people. Um, am I going way over here, Dr. Adkins? I know you said I had a 45 minutes, but... Yeah, you've still, you've still got some time. Okay, I wanted to make sure I wasn't like spending way too much time on some of these things. So I didn't want to go like too short, and I didn't want to go too long. So, all right. So religion and politics, this is kind of what you're waiting for. You're political science, you've been talking about religion, sociology, let's get into politics and public administration, which is where I'm going with this. So we've oftentimes associated religion with conservatives, but I wanna point out that religion and religious-like behavior is not isolated to conservatives, right? Yes, religion, maybe, but we have liberals doing the same thing, right? That are imposing their values and others. And if you don't abide by those values, then there is something morally wrong about you. And we call this like liberal monism or secular repressive. Like I think about the organization PETA, um, the people for the, what is it? Protection of animals or something like that, right? It's ethical treatment of animals. Ethical treatment of animals, thank you, right? Now, not everybody's a vegan, all right? So not everybody's a vegan, but they try and they'll go to events where people are having you know, barbecues and things like that and they'll, They'll, they'll protest and they'll barge in and they'll make, you know, basically accuse you of crimes, right, for eating animals, right? But, and then I would say this is a very liberal group, and I would also say that they're imposing their values on others who don't have those same values, right? Not everybody's a vegan. I'm not a vegan. I don't, I'm not really a meat eater either, so I'm, but I like to have the option every now and then, <laughs> right? But I don't want anyone screaming at me, telling me I'm somehow morally derived. Uh, bereft if I am not, if I'm, if I'm eating meat, uh, because that's not really my values, right? So this, you know, you're imposing those values on me. Um, but this, what's really interesting is social, the social justice perspective actually doesn't have a linkage to liberal uh, thought in the United States. It actually has a linkage to a 19th century Jesuit monk uh, that is based within religion. Christianity didn't always used to be associated with uh, conservatism in the United States. Actually, Christianity, if you go back to the 20th century, was associated with socialism. We had the social gospelers and, and Christian socialism. And there was a whole, diet, whole idea of, of caring for the poor and the sick that was built into their mission that became kind of what was called Christian socialism at the time. I mean, religion has acted as a filter across different domains for for years, education, family, drugs, foreign affairs, we see it all the time. Uh, education is really an important one. We talk about that a lot. I'm sure in Tennessee, there's a lot of discussions that overlap with religion. And you see a lot of these parents show up at school boards, right? And they, 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 they don't like the school, they don't like the textbook uh, because um, it doesn't, or it, it doesn't present an accurate picture or a too secular picture of uh, Christianity or history of Christianity or Europe, or it includes discussions of other religions. I don't want that, right? Um, so uh, this is where I get to play my audio. So just to like confirm that um, this is going on in our, our country, uh, that the religion is really crossed over into politics, you can hear it from our own politicians. So 
At, uh, Dr. Atkins, if this if you can't hear the audio, let me know. Uh, but I'm gonna try this, okay? All right. Two Corinthians, right? Two Corinthians, three seventeen. That's the whole ball game. Where the spirit of the Lord, right? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And here there is Liberty College, but Liberty University. But it is so true. You know, when you think, and that's really. Is that the one? Is that the one you like? I think that's the one you like, because I loved it. And it's so representative of what's taken place. But we are going to protect Christianity. And if you look what's going on throughout the world, you look at Syria, where they're, if you're Christian, they're chopping off heads. You look at the different places, and Christianity, it's under siege. I'm a Protestant. I'm very proud of it. Presbyterian, to be exact. But I'm very proud of it. Very, very proud of it. And we've got to protect because bad things are happening. Very bad things are happening. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar, and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Sadly, multiple police officers, both on duty and off duty, were among those killed or injured. But what these people did for each other says far more about who we are as Americans than the cowardly acts of a killer ever could. The Gospel of John reminds us that there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. The memory of those who displayed the ultimate expression of love in the midst of an unimaginable act of hate will never fade. Their examples will serve as an eternal reminder that the American spirit cannot and will not ever be broken. In the days ahead, we will grieve as a nation, we will honor the memory of those lost as a nation, and we will come together, united as one nation, under God and indivisible. And with that, I'll take your questions. Do you hate the president, Madam Speaker? Because I don't, I don't Collins, hate anybody. Representative I don't Collins, have to raise the Catholic House. We don't hate anybody, not anybody in the world. So don't, don't accuse, accuse me. I did not accuse you. You did, you did. I asked a question. And, and Representative Collins yesterday suggested that the Democrats are doing this simply because they don't like the guy. I have nothing to do with it. Let me just say this. I think it's an important I point. think the president is a coward when it comes to helping uh, our, our kids who are afraid of gun violence. I think he is cruel when he doesn't deal with the, the, helping our dreamers. The, of which we're very proud. I think he's in denial about the about the uh, climate crisis. However, that's about the election. This is about the elect. Take it up in the election. This is about the Constitution of the United States and the facts that lead to the president's violation of his oath of office. And as a Catholic, I resent your using the word hate in a sentence that addresses me. I don't hate anyone. I was raised in a way that is full, a heart full of love and always prayed for the president. And I still pray for the president. So, and they're talking about the United States of America, talking about the United States of America, because when Matthew mentioned it in the Bible, he wasn't talking about the physical ground that he was on. He was talking about something in the distance. So if we are going to have one nation under God, which we must, we have to have one religion, one one. One nation under God and one religion under God, right? All of us together working. All right. So I had to, I had to show that last part. And I know we only got a few minutes left. So uh, this is what I'll say. That's like kind of my concluding comment here. Uh, so there's going to be a natural overlap with, with religion uh, and, and governing and governance, right? I think that's going to happen. In our politics, you saw it with our politicians. Uh, you see it in our administrations. You see it in the way that people administer uh, that it's it's built into why they do the work that they do, right? It's a natural part of it, and that's okay. Um, but here's the thing: uh, it it cannot be allowed. And I'll, let me skip ahead here. It cannot be allowed to uh, to be exclusionary. Okay. So 
exclusionary uh, in the sense that if someone is not of a particular religion of you or they don't believe in what you believe, uh, that can't be used in a way to, to discriminate and exclude other people. Uh, in the case I've always think about that comes to my mind is Kim Davis. Uh, you know, she didn't agree with same-sex couples getting married and she refused marriage licenses for same-sex couple in Kentucky. Now, what is interesting is that just a few days ago, the judge said that uh, she violated these couples' rights by refusing those marriage licenses. And, and, and through that, she's gonna be uh, liable for all the court fees and, and the damages uh, in estimates of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, of course, she was fired from her job for doing this. You know, is it, you know, because she doesn't agree with it, does I give her a right as um, the county clerk to deny uh, a marriage license to this couple? And the answer is no, she does not. Uh, but her religion, you know, and her religious inclinations led her to that, um, to say, I'm, this is not part of what I believe, and therefore it's a violation of my rights. The judges have ruled otherwise. Um, this is where it becomes a problem. So it's good because it emphasizes public service. Bad when it's exclusionary. And it's at the end of the chapter, that's pretty much what I say. <laughs> so, all right, that's it. <laughs> All right, so let me unmute myself here and uh, stop your sharing. So uh, if, if you're in the audience and you have any questions, uh, please share those with us. So we do have one question right now, uh, and uh, it's, it's good. It's related to something else we're going to talk about later this week. Uh, the question is, uh, or a comment, many universities are seeking instructors or directors of diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Uh, what is your view of where discussions on religious diversity fits or doesn't fit into these kinds of courses? Uh, and then the, the uh, question says, uh, I ask this as uh, anonymously someone who interviewed for a DEI uh, instructional position and had a selection committee member make fun of religion twice during the interview. She didn't know she was making fun of my faith denomination. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um... You know, I, I am a person of faith as well. Uh, and, and so religion is important to me. Uh, and I noticed that in many discussions and diversity, equity, inclusion, that it does not include uh, discussions on faith, which I think is a big problem actually, uh, because that is a part of the discussion. And I think that when people talk about religion in a way that puts people down who believe in, believe in religion, I think that that's kind of a violation of what diversity, equity, inclusion is even about from the start, right? It's part of diversity. Actually, it's the, it's the foundational part of diversity of our country. <laughs> uh, you know, that is the, the built in to the very fabric of this nation. Uh, it's, when we talk about diversity, if we don't start out talking about diversity with talking about diversity of our faiths, uh, in our religious beliefs, then it's what happened to, you know, to our, the foundation of diversity in the United States and what we really talk about with diversity includes uh, race, ethnicity, sexuality, right, sexual orientation, includes all of these things, uh, but also it's many times excluded, exclusionary of religion. And what's interesting is that um, one of the things I didn't have a chance to talk about in the presentation was um, the court case that Dr. Atkins is probably very familiar with, um, uh, Masterpiece Cake uh, versus Colorado Commission of Civil Rights. I don't know if I put it in the right order or not. Uh, it was Master, no, oh, Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Uh, they, uh, the, the, the Masterpiece Cake Shop owner, Mr. Phillips, uh, won that case. It went all the way to the Supreme Court and won the case. And the reason why he won the case uh, and, it, you know, it's not that the situation wasn't discriminatory. He certainly discriminated against uh, the gay couple that wanted a cake for their, their wedding ceremony, and he denied them and said that, that he would not provide that cake if he didn't agree with their marriage. Uh, certainly it was discriminatory, but what happened was the Colorado Civil Rights Commission um, made several comments, public comments, that were very discriminatory towards Mr. Phillips and his religion. And that was considered in a Supreme Court case. And because of those comments from the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, a governmental body, uh, the head of that governmental body, uh, they lost the case 
because they chose to be discriminatory towards Mr. Phillips, who I can only assume is a Christian, maybe evangelical, I'm not sure, uh, that doesn't, doesn't agree with, with same-sex marriage. So, um, yeah. All right, uh, we've got another question here. Uh, question references uh, first, the First Amendment. Uh, the, the question is, uh, the First Amendment provides freedom of religion as well as freedom from religion. Uh, with the government able to withhold funds from religious entities that provide public service, uh, such as missions and soup kitchens, if they preach to the masses, do you think there will be a decrease in public service from religious entities in the future with the current political climate? Yeah, that's, that's also a good question. So, um, Dr. Adkins, uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with all the, the cases that have come be before the Supreme Court when it comes to religious freedom, but a lot of them have to do with uh, government funding of schools, like, for instance, access to many of the, the grant programs that are available to, to secular public institutions that, uh, or, or not public, but like nonprofit institutions that are not religious religious institutions get access to them equally, just like non-religious institutions. Um, and most of those cases where they were denied either from the federal or the state, mostly state governments are doing this, uh, they've gone to Supreme Court, right, Dr. Atkins, and they have won almost every single time. Yeah, uh, the religious institutions have won every single time because it is uh, in the constitution. <laughs> Kind of a no-brainer. I don't know, Dr. Atkins. You're you're the law guy. <laughs> well, and this is this is certainly your area, and this is a it's an interesting talk. I I guess my question is, based on all that you've studied and put together, and, and you've uh, written book chapters on this topic. Uh, so, where what do you think the next steps are? What do you think uh, is, is coming down the line? And, and if you were going to uh, prescribe something, uh, mm. changes to, to maybe acknowledge people of, of different faiths, mm. uh, what, what can be done at the local level? Yeah, well, I, you know, in my book chapter, and certainly with future research going forward, and I am going to continue doing research on this area because I think it's important, uh, I, I make the, the note in the book that, well, first off, I need to understand just how people with religious inclinations, people who are religious uh, from different religious denominations, different religions, uh, who are working in our, you know, say our local governments or state governments or, you know, any form of government or nonprofit organization, right? You get a lot of uh, people in nonprofit organizations that are quite religious too, uh, not necessarily working for religious institutions or religious nonprofits. Um, how does that, how do they connect their values with the work that they do, right? And, and whether or not that connection leads to situations like Kim Davis, where um, clearly the situation with Kim Davis was a problem, right? And people think about religion, they think about the intersection of religion and government, that's what they think. They think Kim Davis, right? That's not what I think, right? I think Kim Davis is an outlier. I think she's clearly an outlier, outlier because we, we talk about the Kim Davis case, right? There is certainly a lot of people who are quite religious that don't view same-sex marriage in the same way, or they maybe disagree with same-sex marriage, but they don't let those values influence the work that they do because they see that they have a professional responsibility to do the work and, and, and interact productively with every single person in their community, whether they agree with them or not, right? Which is kind of what I'm getting at, right? I wanna know those connections more. And there's nothing that I can see policy-wise that could ever lead, like for instance, to a situation in France where it's like the state tries to invade your personal space and tell you how you can express your religion. I don't think that will ever be tolerated in the United States, right? So when we say freedom from religion, we're not talking like a French Republican model, right? Where it's like, we're gonna tell you what you can wear, you know, what, you know, you know there, there's, what, the United States is um, never gonna go that route because again, it's our history, it's our culture. Um, but I do want to know what we can be doing in public administration programs, Dr. Atkins, to make sure that when we do have a lot of people coming through our doors as students, getting masters of public administration, who are quite religious. I mean, in my class, when I was getting my PhD, I would say half of the students in the class were uh, regular churchgoers, and some of them um, very religious, and you could hear that in their opinions. And what can we do in public administration programs to ensure that uh, it's great, those are your values, um, but are productively channeled so that they're serving the public, whoever the public is, 
and, and being able to work constructively with diverse populations, uh, both in their position, like in their job, like their organization where they work, but also with the people that they're interacting with on a daily basis. I think we'd be failing our students if we didn't prepare them uh, for an increasingly diverse workforce and increasingly diverse community. Um, but I think it'd be a terrible idea to try to help tell them to suppress their values, any of those values of which brought them to want to pursue public service in the first place. Well, and, and one of our uh, viewers just right from the beginning said, good point. Uh, it's assumed religion is left at the door, but often it, it isn't. And it's part of uh, those who are drawn to public service. And I think uh, uh, I can remember back to being in my own MPA program and, uh, and what I teach now, talking about public service motivation, why people get into uh, working for government or for nonprofits, what motivates those people to, uh, to, to do better at their jobs. And it's, it's often not money. You can, you can offer people more money, but uh, really it's, it's having uh, exposure and opportunity to work with clients. Uh, and maybe sometimes public services uh, motivations tied in with having that religious background. Uh, we have another comment uh, says, I think it would be interesting to measure what percent of PA employees see public service as linked to their faith beliefs in serving others, doing good, et cetera. Uh, I believe that many K through 12 educators and emergency personnel would be people of faith. Thus, it becomes hard to ignore this diversity element in PA education, or even worse, professors sometimes being antagonistic toward faith. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Can I share my screen one more time, Dr. Atkins? Yeah, go for it. Okay, uh, because I want to share my, my bar graph, and then I'll, I'll stop sharing, and then I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, these are the states by religiosity. It means that they surveyed people in the state, and they found that uh, religion is very, very important to them. Uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Utah, Louisiana. Okay, I'm in Louisiana. And then there's Tennessee, just within the top, like five or six states are in the top states for uh, people that are religious. So I would think, uh, and I'll stop sharing now, I would think that uh, if you're, you know, in Tennessee and you're, you're, you're planning on, you know, are you teaching MPA students or having MPA students or people filling positions in Tennessee, that the likelihood that those people are pursuing careers in public service because of religion is quite high uh, and that most of your students are going to be faith-based, that they're going to be quite religious. And you have to accept that reality. Uh, and I think it is interesting to get into uh, some of the research that you, you suggest in, in understanding uh, how many public PA employees are, are faith-based, but I can guarantee that it's going to be a high percent. Uh, there's research out there to kind of confirm this. What I need to know, what I think a lot of scholars in the field want to know is just how that translates into the work that they do and whether or not that translates productively or or in a, an antagonistic way. And you mentioned the word antagonistic towards faith, but sometimes faith, faith people can be very antagonistic for people who are not of their faith. And what I, that's a big worry for me uh, because that just creates some of those same cohesion problems I brought up at the very beginning of the class. We're a heterogeneous society. You know, I had a wonderful chance to go to Knoxville when I met Dr. Atkins in a very diverse city in Eastern Tennessee. Trying to impose one world view upon all of those people would be a huge mistake. So, yeah, that's my thing. <laughs> well, good, good, good. Well, uh, this has been a really interesting talk. And I, I think if you're in the audience uh, and Dr. Hummel, too, uh, you might want to stick around for the next talk, uh, uh, Dr. John Grove. Uh, but before we talk about that, uh, where can we find out more about what you're doing, what you're writing, uh, and maybe the, the programs that you're teaching in? Yeah, um, so it, can, I, can I talk about ULM and our MPA program? So we got, yeah, yeah, I don't go want to compete with, you, with your program, Dr. <laughs> Atkins, of course, but you know, we have a fully online Masters of Public Administration program. Um, I have been tasked with teaching program evaluation, budgeting and finances, as well as intergovernmental relations. Um, and uh, many of my classes, uh, well, the online classes are not synchronous, so many times it's just uh, we have things that we do, project-based things that we do on, on Moodle. We use Moodle, not Blackboard here. Uh, and, um, and, but in in-class, uh, which are in-class portions for our undergrads, uh, it's a very seminar, kind of deliberative discussion forum-based uh, class format where many of these topics that like, for instance, I just brought up today, I had a discussion about this today in my class on social media and politics. 
And I just love that. There's so much learning that occurs. And I look at learning as a two-way street. Like I know that I have the PhD, I'm coming into the room with the doctorate, uh, but I, I'm learning from everybody I interact with, whether it's students, whether it's colleagues, new ideas come that way. And uh, when I was teaching uh, with the MPA program at, at Lincoln Memorial over the summer last summer, I learned a lot from those students because they were law students. And I had never taught an MPA program based on a law program. And so it's a different, it's, it's different. I taught in a business uh, pro, uh, program, uh, political science, which is where I'm at now. And, and in law was with Dr. Adkins and, and those students, uh, some of them were getting their JDs, right? Uh, going on to get their JDs. I had never had that many uh, law students in a particular class. So I had a different group. It was really fascinating. Um, and so um, I, I would say that both programs are amazing, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, if you want to learn more uh, about some of the work I'm doing, uh, I'm, I, there's my, uh, my website. Um, you can go on there and check it out. Um, there's some stuff on there. Uh, and um, it's, it's Hummel-research.com uh, for those watching a recording later on. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. that was viewable. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an excellent talk and uh, excellent contribution to uh, our, our first annual and uh, Zuma Palooza and our first day ever of Zuma Palooza. Uh, I, th I think this has been uh, really interesting.